that in addressing the topic of uh, the Trinity and text and translation, they're actually, you know, a whole constellation of passages that are relevant, uh, that have been touched by issues related to text and translation. The Coma Ioanneum, 1 John 5, 7 and 8, the three heavenly witnesses, of course, is a significant passage. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, even related to things like punctuation in Romans 9.5, uh, where some modern translations have tried to downplay a direct connection between Jesus and God. Uh, and so there, there's a whole constellation of passages. We're focusing in this conference, though, on John 1.18 as a specific example of this sort of phenomenon. And uh, uh, Jonathan has already uh, talked about this, but I wanna revisit uh, this text if we can, and I'd, I'd like to uh, read it once again for us from John chapter one and verse 18, which says, "'No man hath seen God at any time, "'the only begotten Son, "'which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So this is the, the passage that we're going to be uh, giving our focus and uh, our attention uh, to. There are, uh, in, with respect to this passage, at least uh, three uh, contemporary uh, issues that have arisen, or three contemporary challenges. The text of John 1.18 the translation of John 1.18, and the theological significance of John 1.18. And so let me just briefly introduce each one of these issues, and then we'll come back and look in a little more detail at each one of them. So uh, first of all, there are, there are issues related to the translation of John 1.18, and Pastor Arnold already spoke of this, but if we look at the traditional um, Tyndale, uh, King James Version translation tradition in English, we see that the, the, the phrase only begotten son, and in Greek it's ha monogenes huios, that's in the traditional text. But in the modern critical text, now instead of the word son, huios, we have the term Theos. Of course, theos is the Greek word for God. Theology comes from this. So the question is, with respect to text, should it read huios, son, or should it read theos, God? And so there we can see uh, two texts laid side by side. There on the left side, you'll see uh, is the, uh, the Texas Receptus. And you see monogenes ha, monogenes weos, the only begotten son. However, if you look at an example of modern critical text, and I pulled up here the SBL 2010 edition of the Greek New Testament, you see that instead of ha, monogenes weos, it reads monogenes theos. And so there's a change from the word son uh, to the word God. And now, now we're on track. Sorry for the mistake earlier. We'll talk secondly about translational issues. And in the Tyndale King James Version translation tradition, that passage in the traditional text, ha monogenes huios, was rendered as the only begotten son. And so the Tyndale... Uh, translation tradition, the, that middle one is the King James Version, and we can contrast that with the modern critical text, and here I've used the ESV as an example, and the ESV re reads not the only begotten son, as in the Tyndale on the left, and that's the King James Version actually in the center, and then on the right now we see the modern translation, and it reads the only God. So it's changed not only the translation of monogenes from only begotten to only, but 
With respect to text, it's changed to the word God rather than the word son. And so there's a translation issue. There is a text issue. And so uh, we see, again, as uh, Pastor Arnold pointed out, this has led to theological questions about how the changes to this verse, both in its text from son to God and in its translation from only begotten to only affects the doctrine of the Trinity. And in particular, the doctrine that is known as the eternal generation of the son. So that's our brief introduction to what the issue is. There's an issue of text, there's an issue of, issue of translation, there's an issue of then theological significance. So now let's backtrack and let's talk a little bit more in depth about the textual issue. And as I noted earlier today, the initial address that I gave you was on providence. That was sort of the bird's eye view. Now we're going to get sort of boots on the ground and we're going to talk about some details about this particular uh, issue. And so um, we're going to start with a survey of what is called the external evidence. When we study a, a text, we look at the extant manuscripts and witnesses that exist for the text. Greek manuscripts, ancient translations, and if you were to study this text and you were to avail yourself of text textual critical resources, what would you find out about the evidence that is externally available? The traditional uh, text, which reads ha monogenes huios, is supported by the following Greek manuscripts. It's found in Codex A or Codex Alexandrinus, which is housed in the British Library in London. It's, it's found in the third corrector of Codex C, which is known as a Frame Rescriptus, which is a palimpsest manuscript. It's also found in, another, in a, a, a number of other unseal manuscripts like Kappa, Gamma, Delta, Theta, Psi, and in several families of manuscripts, including Family 1 and Family 13. The traditional text, as it reads in the Texas Receptus, is the majority text. It is found in the majority of extant manuscripts. In fact, it is the reading found in every minuscule manuscript that is, is in existence, that, it, that is extant and available to us now, except for one, which is known as Manuscript 33. According to Wilbur Pickering, uh, in his Greek New Testament, according to Family 35, the traditional text reading, ha monogenes huios, which reads son, that is the reading in over 99% of the extant Greek manuscripts. With respect to ancient versions or translations, it is the reading that is found in the Old Latin, the Curitonian Syriac, and the Harclean Syriac. So what is the external evidence for the modern critical text reading, which would be uh, read theos, God, rather than son? Well, there are two varieties of this. The first variety is, has the word monogenes and theos, and it's supported, I'm using the evidence here that's provided in the Nestle Alon 28th edition critical apparatus. It's supported by four Greek manuscripts, Papyrus 66, the original hand of Codex Sinaiticus, which is also in the British Library in London, Codex Vaticanus, which by its name you might know is found in the Vatican Library, and in the original hand of C, uh, Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. Among the ancient versions, it is the reading of the Peshitta Syriac, and it's a marginal reading in the Harclean Syriac. Okay, so that's one variety. There's another variant that uh, is, would include the definite article ha, ha monogenes theos, 
And that's found in three Greek manuscripts. Papyrus 75, the first corrector of Sinaiticus, and in the minuscule that I mentioned earlier, minuscule 33. So when it comes down to it, the traditional reading is in 99 plus percent of the extant manuscripts. The reading that is chosen in the modern critical text uh, is given witness to in, uh, according to the Nestle 28th edition, seven manuscripts. And it reads in two different ways. Uh, some of them, four of them without the definite article, three of them with the definite article. So, when we come to the 19th century, Westcott and Hort are attempting to reconstruct the Greek New Testament, and what do they do? They are influenced by the twin heavyweights, the twin darlings of modern textual criticism, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. And so based on the fact that in those documents, it reads God or Theos rather than Weos, son. That's the reading that they went with in their modern critical text. In the 20th century, the, the papyri began to be discovered, but Westcott and Hort made their decisions about the modern critical text before there was the discovery of any papyri. The discovery of P66 and P75 have uh, been claimed by modern critics like Metzger and others as strengthening the modern critical view, but again, it remains very much a minority uh, reading as far as the extant witnesses go. Let me move on now, and again, we're gonna get real boots on the ground just to show you uh, what some of the manuscripts look like. And so this is an excerpt from John 1.18 that's in Codex Sinaiticus. And if you look at this, you can see here that it looks like an M, and the Omicron is written in a small letter at the top, probably because it was left out on the column there, and then mono, genes, and then at the end, you'll see a, the, the Greek letter theta, and what looks like a capital C, but that's a final sigma, and then over it, there's a little line, and that's an abbreviation that's known as a nomina sacrum, the Greek word for God, theos, is theta, epsilon, omicron, sigma. But some of the ancient scribes, when they got to that word, because it's written many times when you're copying out the Bible, they would use this abbreviation. They would put a theta and a sigma and then draw a line over it. Again, that's called uh, one of the nomina sacra. And so it does read, Sinaiticus, in its original hand, does read theta, sigma, which is God, monogenes uh, theos. Um, there's a little bit of a close-up to show you that just a little closer. And uh, let's look at Vaticanus. Vaticanus is known by modern scholars the way they catalog them today as manuscript 03. And um, we see also, if we look at Vaticanus in John 1.18, that we have, oops, we have the same phenomenon where we have mono, genes, and then we've got the theta, the sigma, and the line over it. So that's the way it reads in Codex Vaticanus. There's a close-up of it, so you can just see it a little bit better. And here's just a listing of some of the common nomina sacra that you find uh, in handwritten New Testament manuscripts. These are the various abbreviations. And you notice I've, I've written out there below in hand script, the theta sigma with a line over it, that's for theos, God. But I wrote underneath it the way that the word son is written in this abbreviated form. And it's the upsilon sigma with a line over it. When you look at those two, they look pretty similar to each other, don't they? And we can imagine that it would be pretty easy for a scribe perhaps to accidentally write theos rather than weos. And that's one um, logical explanation as to how possibly that the theos reading 
entered into the manuscript tradition rather than the son, Theos, reading. Let's look at the earliest extant witness to the traditional text, and this is in the unsealed manuscript Codex Alexandrinus. And if you look at it, you can see monogenes, and it's kind of smudged there on the end. If you look on this side, this is the word son. And here he doesn't use, the scribe didn't use a nomen sacra. He wrote the word out. So it's upsilon, iota, omicron, sigma. Monogenes huios. That's the, that's the earliest uh, extant witness for the traditional text reading. And of course, this becomes the dominant reading, the consensus reading that is in, in 99% plus of the early manuscripts. With respect to the external evidence, what about what is known as the patristic evidence or the church fathers? I had a, a, a pastor friend, Lloyd Sprinkle, if you've ever read Sprinkle Publications books. Um, pastor Sprinkle served a Reformed Baptist church in Harrisonburg, Virginia for over 50 years, is now with the Lord. But he uh, often said, the church fathers should really be called the church infants because uh, sometimes they, 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 they uh, didn't get things right, but they're, they're interesting um, resources historically for trying to understand theology and text and such. Um, I'm gonna draw on some material here that came from an article by Theodore Letus, who did a more deep dive article looking at the usage among the church fathers. And uh, what he looked at was he, he did find that there were some church fathers who used the word theos, monogenes theos. And so there were some of them. He says there are 11 writers, and he found 39 citations. But you'll notice that the earliest ones he found were from the Valentinians, which were a Gnostic sect. On the other hand, with respect to the traditional reading, he also found this was well attested, even better attested by the patristic authors. He found 20, more than 20 of them, and over 40 citations. And uh, he also made the observation that whereas there were some Orthodox writers who would use monogenes uh, theos, uh, that that, that there were no heterodox authors that showed a preference for the traditional reading. And he sees um, some significance um, in that. Here were his, some of his conclusions. Both terms appear in early Christian writings. Both are used by Orthodox writers, but only the theos reading is associated with heterodox writers. Letus suggests that the theos reading originated in Egypt and came to be associated with Valentinian Gnosticism, for which John was a favorite gospel. He cites a scholar named Ezra Abbott, who suggested that the term monogenes theos, which is the reading of the modern critical text, later became popular with Arians, who were fond of calling the Son the only begotten God, because while the term expressed his high dignity, it brought into view what was, from their perspective, his derived existence. Begotten by an act of God's will, he could not, they argued, be eternal. Letus also sees significance in the fact that Athanasius, the great champion of Nicene Orthodoxy, exclusively used the sun reading, the huios, the monogenes huios reading. Let's turn and think for a few moments about the internal evidence. When you ask about the internal evidence, what you're asking is how does the passage fit with the rest of the gospel, its theology, its grammatical usage, and so forth. The, the modern uh, critical folk like Metzger uh, suggests that son would be what they would call the easier reading but what's the tendency of modern uh, textual criticism? It's to say that the more difficult reading is better. 
And, he, and Metzger looks at uh, the Gospel of John and he says the, the, the term of the only begotten Son uh, shows up in places like John 3.16, John 3.18, and in 1 John 4.9. It's Johannine. And so according to his logic, the reading God in John 1.18 must be original because it's more difficult. But what's what would be the, the, the opposite of that? Well, it would be to say that the traditional reading makes sense because it fits with the usage of the Apostle John uh, when he wrote his gospel. There's a bias in modern textual criticism against harmonious and orthodox statements. And somehow they believe that the more primitive statements were the unorthodox ones, betraying uh, their assumptions that er the, the earliest Christian writings didn't uphold what we know today as orthodox. And they want to throw off what they feel like is the burden of dogma. And, but the alternative is that actually the traditional reading is right because it fits with John's usage because he held to uh, the view that the Lord Jesus is the eternal, eternally begotten Son of the Father. Um, Metzger also discusses alternatives relating to whether it has that definite article in it or not. For now, I'm just going to uh, skip over that part of it. Let me just note that in the end, Metzger in his textual commentary gave the modern critical text reading monogenes theos only a B rating. And in fact, in the textual commentary composed by Metzger on the modern critical text, this uh, listing at John 1.18 provided one of the examples where they allowed the committee to present a minority report that was put forward by Alan Wittgren. And he asserted against his colleagues that the modern text reading is doubtful. This is not a pro-TR guy. This is a modern critical academic guy. But even he said, we're on shaky ground changing this from son to God. He suggested it may be a primitive transcriptional error in the Alexandrian tradition due to confusion over the nomina sacra, just what I was talking about earlier, that a scribe would have confused the original upsilon sigma and written instead theta sigma so that these, these seven manuscripts that have theta sigma, that those are simply a scribal error that appeared and then was overcome as there was a general consensus about how this passage should be properly copied and transmitted. And so he gave uh, his own modern critical text a D rating rather than a B rating. Uh, let's move on and talk just briefly about why this issue is important theologically. This textual difference holds vital Christological significance. Did the original uh, text refer to Jesus as the only begotten Son or as the only God, as in the modern critical text? On one hand, someone might say, well, isn't it a good thing if the text says that Jesus is Theos. And they might say, well, you know, sometimes the modern critical text uh, takes away from the deity of Christ. It wants to change 1 Timothy 3.16 to he was manifest in the flesh rather than God was manifest in the flesh. But isn't it a good thing that it uses the word Theos here in reference to God? But the problem with that is that it ignores the fact that the replacement of son with God can actually serve to weaken the Orthodox Trinitarian view of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son. The Theos reading, far from being intended to affirm the deity of Jesus, might well have been promoted by some who were attempting to deny that he was the eternally begotten Son, and that he was more like a demigod. And so that's why they felt like they could use the word Theos. They didn't mean the triune God. They meant something like a demigod. 
Let's talk about, we backtracked on text. Let's backtrack and talk a little bit more about translation, although um, Pastor Arnold's already addressed this, uh, begun to address it for us. So let's look at it, though, a little bit more. Um, so we've got the issues related to the translation, and this is related to monogenes. How should that word be translated? The traditional translation in English is only begotten. And that translation comes from seeing the word monogenes as deriving from two words. First, the word monos, which means only, and the verb genao, which means to bear or beget. But as Pastor Arnold already mentioned, beginning in the late 20th century, this traditional translation began to be challenged on the basis of etymology. It was argued that monogenes derived not from monos plus genao to beget, but from monos plus genos, coming from the verb genomai, meaning to be or to become. And so the suggestion was made that the way the word monogenes should be translated would be only or only one of its kind or unique. The first modern translation to adopt the new translation, while interestingly enough retaining the traditional text, was the Revised Standard Version in 1952, which reads, No one has ever seen God, the only Son. See, it kept the traditional textual word, Son, but it changed the translation of monogenes from only begotten to simply only. And uh, so... It actually reads traditionally in the second half of it, too. Who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. The other modern translation soon followed suit, beginning with the NIV in 1978, which rendered ha monogenes as the one and only. And the NIV also embraced the modern critical text. And so the NIV reads at John 1.18, but God... Theos, changing the text, the one and only, taking the new translation of monogenes. Modern translations now typically use only as the translation. We see this in the NRSV, the ESV, the New American Standard Bible, or one and only in the Holman Christian Standard Bible or the Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, and the New Living Translation. Another translation and text issue has arisen as to whether monogenes might be taken substantively with God in opposition to it. And so it'll say something like in the ESV footnote, the only one, monogenes, and then in op opposition to it, God. Or the NIV, God, the one and only, so that they are in opposition one to another. The New American Standard Bible of 2020 offered a translation of John 1.18 that attempted to make use of both text traditions, including both the words Son and God, although no extant manuscripts offer such a reading, as well as the new translation of monogenes, although they did put Son in italic, but they just tried to put something in there, although it's not really a reading that's not found in any extant manuscript. So here's just a brief rundown of, of how this is sort of, you can sort of see this evolved in this translation history. So we start off with the Tyndale authorized version, the only begotten son. We go to the American Standard Version, 1901. Interesting enough, it continues the Tyndale King James Version tradition. It's when we get to the RSV in 1952, that we have the only son, new, the new translation, but they kept the old uh, text, the traditional text. Then with the NS, uh, New American Standard Bible of 1960, we go full bear. We, we, well, no, we don't go full bear. We've got the traditional translation, but the new text, the only begotten God. We go to the NIV, 1978. God, the only one. They've gone with the new text and the new translation. ESV, the only God, the new text, the new translation. And the Legacy Standard Bible, which just came out 
two years ago, goes back to the New American Standard Bible, the only begotten God, the old translation of monogenes, but the new text using the word God. Let's talk now, we've talked about the text, we've talked about the translation, let's talk a little bit more about the theology. John 1.18, and the eternal generation of the Son. Uh, Pastor Arnold already read to you from the Nicene Creed, how that, going back to the Nicene Creed, it reads, the only begotten Son. But we've got these new translations now who have changed it to only God. But in the last decade, even some in broader evangelical and even mainline Protestant churches have begun to raise questions about theological problems related both to the modern text and the modern tra translation of John 1.18. In particular, they began to question themselves whether this new text and new translation undermine the traditional doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son. We see an example of this in a book written in 2021. It was named the Christianity Today Book of the Year for 2021, written by a guy named Matthew Barrett. He teaches at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. Again, he's not a pro-TR guy, but he wrote this book on the Trinity titled Simply Trinity, and in it he talks about a drift in evangelical theology away from classical Trinitarian theism, especially in its articulation of what is known as the eternal relations of origins in the Godhead, so that the Orthodox typically spoke of the Father as eternally unbegotten the Son as eternally begotten, and the Spirit as eternally spirated or proceeding. Barrett notes in particular that some modern theologians have rejected the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son, especially with regard to contemporary evangelical promotion of the heterodox idea of the eternal functional subordination of the Son or EFS, some have referred to this as, as modern subordinationism, and there's been a claim that people like Wayne Grudem and um, Bruce Ware have taught eternal functional subordination of the sun rather than eternal generation of the sun. In his book on pages 185 to 190, Barrett addresses in particular the way modern translations have changed monogenes from only begotten to only or one and only. He says this, and again, this is from a mainstream evangelical, not somebody who's in our camp. He says this, when it comes to the gospel of John, a misstep has been made, and it is no small one. Its theological consequences are serious. In the 20th century, scholars erased only begotten from John's corpus and replaced this phrase with only or unique instead. Whether it was intentional or not, he continues, generations of Christians were never introduced to the concept of the eternal generation, nor could they see why the concept was so ingrained in Scripture's presentation of the Son of God not even in a gospel like John's, but, Barrett says, that consensus is now changing. Jonathan made reference to this uh, article written by a Presbyterian minister in the U.S., Charles Lee Irons. Uh, he wrote this book in a volume titled Retrieving Eternal uh, Generation that came out in 2017. Remember how I told you that language of retrieval is popular right now? Uh, among uh, current writers. And anyway, he has this article in there in which he studies, does an in-depth study of monogenes. He looks at the parallel secular Greek literature. He looks at the Septuagint. He looks at the biblical literature. In particular, he looks at the usage within John. And in the end, he argues that monogenes cannot be reduced to being translated as only one of his kind, or only, but, he says, it must have a metaphorical, biological meaning 
only begotten. This is not a pro TR guy. But he's saying just based on the evidence, the only begotten reading is the proper reading of monogenes. Irons is particularly critical of the English Standard Version. He offers three points of criticism. He says, first, per perhaps without fully realizing it, the ESV translators have removed one occurrence of monogenes out of the frame of reference of the other four Johannine usages. Secondly, he says, the problem with ESV's translation, the only God, is that it could be easily misused as a proof text for what he calls modalistic monarchianism or the Jesus-only heresy of oneness Pentecostalism. We have in the U.S. T.D. Jakes, who promotes what's known as oneness Pentecostalism. I'm guessing you probably have this here too. But these folk believe that in the Old Testament, God was the Father. In, at the time of the incarnation of Christ, God was Jesus. And now... God is the Holy Spirit. They're Pentecostals. Oneness only Pentecostalism. And so Iron says, if you make the translation of John 1.18 the only God, you, you, you've provided potentially a proof text for oneness Pentecostalism. Thirdly, he says, the ESV's rendering produces an unintended result. If the only God as they put it, is a person who is at the Father's side, then the only God is distinct from the Father. It doesn't make theological sense. Now, I have to say, and uh, I think that Jonathan already said this, we're, I'm not suggesting, neither was he, that you would accept all of Irons' um, analysis because although he's great on monogenes, sadly, he accepts the text, Theos, which I think is, you know, just a, a serious error as a translation of monogenes. However, he does say that the new translations of monogenes uh, risk being out of sync with the Nicene Creed, and therefore they risk being out of sync with um, traditional orthodoxy, and really, for somebody who's not in the TR camp, he really asked some great questions. This is drawn from a podcast he did. He said this. He said, we need to start asking these sorts of questions. Who are making the translations? And why are they making them? And he says, we do have a big problem on our hands. The church needs to have a Bible that is consistent with its creed. Drawing it back to uh, our confessional Presbyterian Baptist uh, backgrounds, if you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 2 and paragraph 3, this is the way it reads. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And then you get the classical Christian Orthodox view of the eternal origins of the persons. Uh, it says, um, the Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Father is unbegotten. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. And look at that second statement about the Son. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. And look at the proof text down at the bottom. What are the two proof texts that they list for that? John 1, 14 and John 1, 18 as a proof for, again, the eternal generation of the Son. Well, believe it or not, friends, we should not be discouraged because Mainstream evangelicals and some mainstream Protestants are realizing they made a mistake with John 1.18. Believe it or not, the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, which came out in 2017, which is published by Crossway, in its text of John 1.18, has gone back to the traditional text, ha monogenes weos. 
There's some good things about the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. They put Mark 16, 9 through 20 with no brackets in the text. There are also some bad things in the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. They take the woman taken in adultery, John uh, 7, 53 through 8, 11, and they take it out of the text and relegate it to the footnotes. But this will be a place where they have realized mistake with the text of John 1, 18, and they're attempting to retrieve or uh, to correct it. What about translations? As I was reflecting on this, this what's happened with John 1.18, I think, is an illustration of the problems one can get into if he departs from the classic, traditional, Protestant translations based on the traditional text. One of the major advantages of maintaining the use of our classic Protestant translation for English speakers, it's the authorized version, is that it guards us against novel innovations that can be introduced in the, into the text or the translation of the Bible, which depart from orthodoxy. I don't know if you're familiar with this book written by Adam Nicholson. He wasn't a believer but he wrote this book about the King James Version back in 2003 titled God's Secretaries. And in that, he describes one of the translators, some of you may be familiar with him given your interest in the authorized version, uh, Lancelot Andrews. And this is what he says about Lancelot Andrews. He says, this man was a library, the repository of 16 centuries of Christian culture. He could speak 15 modern languages and six ancient. But the heart and bulk of his existence was his sense of himself as a worm. He saw himself as a sinner. Brilliant man, a library, a repository of 16 centuries of Christian learning and Christian orthodoxy. And Nicholson says, people like Lancelot Andrews no longer exist. He says, it is because people like Lancelot Andrews flourished in the first decade of the 17th century and do not now that the greatest translation of the Bible could be made then and cannot now. See what he's saying? One of the advantages or we can extrapolate from it. He's not saying, he's not a believer, he's not in our camp, but, but he's making a very important point. See, Lancelot Andrews wouldn't have let Monogenes Theos get into the text of the Bible. He wouldn't have let the only God in as a translation of the Bible because his antenna would have been up for Orthodox Trinitarian understanding of the Bible. And we don't have men like that anymore, but they were here and they've given us an excellent translation that is orthodox. You can see it's a good reason to stick with this translation based on this old text. Let me offer a couple conclusions. The traditional text of John 1.18, including the term ha monogenes Quios, the only begotten son, appears in 99% of extant Greek manuscripts, including some of the earliest unseals, like Codex Alexandrinus. It reflects the consensus reading of historic Christianity. The traditional translation of monogenes as only begotten in English was a Christian consensus until the late 20th century. This isn't something, but this is only the last 70 years, friends. The abandonment of this traditional translation has implications for subtly undermining the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son. Therefore, the traditional text and translation of John 1.18 should continue to be maintained by those who have continued to uphold it, and it should be retrieved by those who have abandoned it. Last slide. Maybe you heard the story that came out just three years ago in 2020 from Valencia, Spain. 
about a painting by the 17th century Spanish master, Marilla. And this was the painting. Well, the owner of this painting decided that it needed to be clean and restored. So he hired a furniture company to restore it. And they took the original, and this is what they came up with. They realized once it was finished that something had gone horribly wrong. And they said, well, let's try again. This is what happened the second time. Friends, let's let that serve as a cautionary tale for us. One might conclude that modern efforts to improve John 1.18 have had a similar result. In an attempt to improve it, those texts and translations were efforts to mar the text and the translation of John 1.18. Thankfully, however, we know that God's word cannot be ultimately damaged by those who either intentionally or unintentionally would do it harm. Why? See lecture one. God will continue to keep his word pure in all ages. Amen?